Here we go. I'm social distancing. Six feet. I'm, we're on? We should okay. Be on. Hey! It's, it's new? <laughs> Let's get rid of the stick. How's everybody doing? I missed you. We missed you. It's noon. It's Festool Friday. And now it's time for Festool Live. Hey, just a quick sound check, a, a quick wave from everybody. Can you hear us? Woo! Because we're doing some new uh, sound stuff today. Okay. Can, oh, Minnie, you can always hear me. Okay. Boy, have we got a show planned for you today. It's all the top questions you guys have been sending us for sanding. Woo! So, got to introduce the room. Over here, we got Big D on the board. Hey, everybody. Behind the camera, we got, well, we'll call him Big C, Chris Seibert. Over here, we got Big M, Minnie. Big M, Minnie. Minnie as in mouse. We also have Brent online. Mini Mouse, of course. But she always introduces herself. I'm Mini Lake Mouse. Okay, that's the spelling. He says uh, real quick, we got to give a shout out to Mark, who says everything's all fine. So hey, good. Mark, thanks for uh, getting back to us. Is Spocky here? Okay. We also have, I think I already said it, but I'll call him out again. Brent, thank you. You're online answering questions. Uh, it makes our job in here a lot easier. Come on in, Spocky. Okay, Spocky doesn't like elevators. Okay, here we go. As always, there you are, buddy. As always, we're on YouTube. It will live on YouTube. Episode, this is episode 43. Yep. We can't believe it. Hopefully, you guys keep staying tuned because I want to go to episode 500 plus. All right, good. Uh, hit the notification. Well, <coughs> excuse me. First, subscribe, please, and then hit the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. Also, It'll live on Facebook today, right afterwards, and Instagram. Depends on how long-winded I am and how long the file is. Okay. <sighs> Did I cover everything, Min Min? Okay. So, don't forget, you, Minnie, come on. You know the best part. Don't forget, Minnie's writing a mile a minute right now because you guys need to tell us where you're from because we appreciate it, and we just love doing this. Okay. So, I'm going to get my hand sanitizer over here out of the way. And we're going to talk about, and um, bear with me, because we broke this down, and I've been going back and forth, back and forth on the right flow. But you guys always ask us, we, well, wait a minute. I think it was like episode two or three, how to pick the right festival sander. My God, would you guys watch that a lot. But th as the questions poured in, and th th about the same questions here at Festool, we get all the time from you. What paper should I use? What grit should I start with? Okay, that's one segment. And then we're going to go over to pads, how to choose the right pad. What the heck is an interface pad? I'll cover that as well. And the other one, which I, I even got an Instagram message this week, how do I eliminate swirl marks? And then I'm going to go in. When I do that, I'll also teach you proper sanding technique with Rotex, okay? Because I want to make sure that you guys get everything covered. So let's start with paper, all right? We're going to tackle that <laughs> abrasive subject. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> oh, my God. There's one. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. All right, here we go. All right, the shtick is getting thick, baby. All right. So when you open up one of our catalogs or you go online, you look at all the different flavors of paper that we offer. It's because you sand different materials. Right. I've broken it down where we got one, two, three, four, five different flavors. Okay. And it used to be a lot more. I think at one time here in North America, we were up to, I think, seven or eight different types of paper. Now, <coughs> when I go through this, there's some variations in there. I'm going to go through what I've learned over time working at Festool. So maybe I can dial you into the right paper okay because this sometimes you're going to own some granite you're going to own some platine you may own some fleece sapphire or reuben it all depends but as a woodworker growing up and uh in working in cabinet shops owning cabinet shops just understanding wow i i, I want to minimize how much paper i have and follow me because i'm going to spend your money today because i know for a fact that you like myself, 
I hate to sand. <laughs> okay, I want to get to that finishing process without skipping too many steps, but I also don't want to spend the rest of my life sanding. Hopefully, you're following this. Okay. Th- are we doing a hopefully I f- you're following this count? There's one. Okay. Now, <laughs> when I go through this, I'll also talk about grit range. Okay. So you always have to think, what am I sanding? What am I sanding today? So am I sanding this natural edge? Am I sanding plywood? Am I sanding a, a, a walnut? Am I sanding hardwood, softwood, whatever? So you got to understand what grit do I start at? Okay, now, with something like this, I laid up this maple, and I got these edges. This is some rock maple. Now, here's the situation with this. Okay, I need to flatten this, just like this slab right here. I need to flatten it. This plywood, what am I trying to accomplish with plywood? I'm trying to do what? Remove max, okay? Now, I would do this. I, uh, uh, the typical woodworker would say, oh, I'll start with 80 grit on this. Okay, and then I'll ask you the question. I'll pump it right back at you. Oh, you must like to sand, or do you like to sand? And I see people scratch their heads, like, what do you mean? I go, I want to start with the lowest possible grit to get this leveled. That's what I'm trying to accomplish, and then I'll go up in grit range. If I start with 80 on this, okay, I'll write it down. If I start with 80, I'm going to spend so much daggone time trying to level this where if I come back here and start with 40, I level it so much quicker, and then the only thing I'm doing, and if we can get in here, Chris, to see this, you see these little cut marks? That's 40 grit cut marks. That's not trying to level, so that's really easy. I would go to 60 and then 80, okay? I would go to 120, 150, and depending on what I'm putting on here, I'd probably start at, stop at 150 or 180. I would never go above when I'm sanding raw wood because I lose absorption or ad- or finish adhesion on raw wood. Okay, so somebody says, well, why do you sell or why do you guys make 220, 320, 400, 5, 600? Well, it's the sand between coats of finish, <laughs> okay, or actually level the finish or polish the finish. So hopefully I've described grit range. If you start at 80, you like to, s- and it's and, and bear with me, you're going to spend so much time. When I, okay, versus if I started with 40 and then worked my way up to 80. Okay, so hopefully you understand that. Save yourself some time. Yeah, you're going to look, oh, I don't want to spend all that money. Then you're going to spend all that time sanding. Okay, so kind of weigh that out. I'm not trying to sell you all this extra paper. I'm trying to sell, save you time because I know what your time is worth. All right, cool. Now, let's talk about the different flavors or different types. I'm going to start with this one here. That's called Reuben, Reuben 2. All right, <laughs> okay. That is for sanding bare wood. Bear with me. Hear me out on this. Then we have this. We used to have two papers in between this. We got rid of them because we came out with this. This is called Granat. Okay, you can get granite from 40 grit all the way to 1500 grit. These are both paper backed. When it gets with granite, when it gets 800, we start to put it the uh, abrasive or load the abrasive on on a film. Okay, all the way to 1500. Now, in saying that, someone says, "Well, that what's that for?" And it was designed early on for high VOC paints. But we started testing that Festool across all surfaces. And if you were to buy, purchase one paper from us, it, it, I would suggest Granat because I'll tell you what, in this training center right here, you'd be hard pressed to find when you open up one of the sustainers, okay, to find anything other than Granat. This stuff is wicked on wood, okay? It, it, I've never used a uh, paper that loads th- the least amount as Granat does, okay? Now, <coughs> this is aluminum oxide, and this is aluminum oxide. But in 40 grit, 60 grit, 80 grit, we also put ceramic in this. This levels like wildfire. It is amazing paper, okay? I tell everybody, just get granite, okay? But you also have something like this. Oh, by the way, paint removal, okay? Uh, you can use it for everything. We call it the combination blade of sandpaper with Vestal. Now we have this. This is uh, sapphire, and this is not paperback. It's got a cloth back to it, okay? 
<clears throat> the nice thing about this, and somebody says, what do you use saf saphir for? I go, well, I use it, uh, I recommend it a lot to painters who are working on older homes to remove multiple coats of paint. This is available in 24 grit all the way to, I think, 100 grit. Okay, so it's really a really strong, long-wearing paper. We call it paper, but it's actually a cloth bag. Then we have this. It's called Platine. That's silicone carbide, and uh, it's on a foam back. It's a very forgiving uh, paper, and when I say that, it's, it's basically a screen, and it's pulled through the foam, the dust, and I use that for acrylics uh, or solid surface material. It's f I use it to polish headlamps on cars. Okay, it's wonderful, and it's available, I think, 400 grit to 4,000 grit. Very fine. We polish a lot with it. And then we have this. This is actually uh, aluminum oxide, but it's on uh, a weave, uh, a thread, uh, a cord. It's woven product. And if I had a microscope and looked at it, you'd see little chunks of aluminum oxide abrasive on there. And we have it in different grits. Like we use the white and the, um, the green one, part of our surfix system for blending oils. You can use this for like the, this is 800 grit. They're, they're labeled fine, coarse, medium. It's basically a scratch bright pad. It's uh, spelled V-L-I-E-S, but pronunciation is fleece, like a fleece sweatshirt, okay? So I use it to uh, take down corrosion on my... Uh, my uh, joint at home and stuff like that. Okay, so we good? Did I cover paper, Minnie? Okay, good. I think I covered it. I covered grit. Okay, so let's go over here. The other question we get is, hey, I got these pad. Uh, I need a new pad for my sander. Uh, which one should I get? I see there's a different bunch of variety of pads. Well, like our saw blades, we color code them. And you can always see, this is the one, and I got the six-inch ones. <laughs> Someone wrote thank you on there. So, uh, this is a six-inch one. This is the one for, that comes on the Rotex. And the way we describe this, we call this the soft pad. We have this one. You see it's always gray. Then we call that the super soft pad, okay? Then you'll see this one that's blue, all right? It's color-coded, once again. That's the hard pad, okay? And then we have a green one. The green one is your polishing a backing pad. Okay, I have these pulled out. These are for the Rotex. Uh, let's talk about what comes with just about every sand. Okay, is this pad? I, I, I um, sometimes I call it the medium pad, but we actually call it call it out as soft. Uh, this is will cover just about every application. Okay, so when you go to replace your pad, just get a, go get a soft pad. Or if you have particular um, applications that you need, let's talk about this, the hard pad. Okay, um, when I'm sanding and leveling, okay, I would bring this right over here. I would put it on the Rotex because the regular pad has a tendency to follow uh, offsets. This is perfect for flattening. Okay, now... You'll see this right here. I have the hard pad I put on my RO90. I use this to maintain when I'm sanding out face frames or doors. It, and you know what? I'm going to swing right over here and get a sample. So if I have right here, I'll just grab this piece right here. Say this is that five-piece beaded door or uh, a piece here. Say I have a Rotex on there, a six-inch pad, right? Uh, in the regular one may round that edge where on my RO90 I can maintain that and still keep that crisp 90. Okay, so th that's, a, that's I think the one of the most perfect applications, flattening and keeping crisp 90s. That's why a 90. Now, I mean a hard pad. Now, the hard pad in the paint industry is used for feathering out chips and feathering paint. So you can, and it's called feathering an edge, okay? <coughs> now, next is this one. It's a super soft pad. And what this, f that this is for, it's not for contours. Everybody says, oh, it must be really spongy. It really isn't, but what it is, it's spongy enough. So you'll see, <coughs> you'll see me uh, describing this again in a few minutes because one of the things you need to know about swirl marks 
is you need it's a lot of it's about your sanding technique okay and if you and I'm gonna go through the drill down on it and if you don't do this one thing this will help you in other words if you don't wipe between grits when you're sanding uh, especially on the higher grits this will help absorb some of that latent grit that you have left on there so it's not taking that say you're sanding at 800 and you have 600 grit some of that six and you haven't blown it off or wiped it off that'll absorb into it that's a super soft pad it allows you to uh, float your sander a little bit better it'll help eliminate possible swirl marks okay now the last one is this and everybody will look at this and go man that's a five inch pad it's not this is for the six inch rotex it's a little bit smaller than the six inch pad and the reason we do that is say you're using this application bonnet right here it'll fit on there and it won't mar that adjacent surface so that's why we have that that's a backing pad for polishing and they're all labeled green okay so I'm gonna stack those off to the side because I want to talk about interface pads a lot of people don't know about them there's actually three and what they do and let me grab a sander really quick Woo! oh right behind me oh, duh! is what they do is instead of changing a pad that's really the, to follow a contour we just interface the pad I call this you ready the Mickey Mouse <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. I told you I was gonna get corny today Minnie okay and the, here's the first version it's really spongy see how thick it is and what it does is you see this top part here say I'm sanding this with 150 okay using the regular pad and now I got to sand a contour and I'm gonna use this in just a couple of minutes okay <coughs> this interfaces it's really quick interfaces with the pad and the paper so watch see how it follows the contour okay now some oh you know what Chris I'm gonna run it what the heck I'm gonna I got a 5 inch ETS 150 okay yeah thank you sir it's got to be a fest tool okay hey everybody remember this this is a quick call out when you put a plug it cord in just don't take it and put it in make sure you take it a full quarter turn now this is a brand new plug it cord and I wanted to call it out as I was doing it because I got to put a little extra oomph in there make sure you do that that way there it won't burn out now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this paper off and I'm gonna put it on my interface pad Whew, that stick fix boy I'll tell you that really grabs I'm gonna put that on there I'm gonna interface it on the pad now you know doing this Chris I'm gonna have you move really quick you know doing this normally let me just take that off let me grab another piece I don't know if I've talked about this before I know I have a thousand times but I don't know if I've been on festival live sanding around over round over you've probably done it a hundred times gang no I'm coming right over here Chris thanks okay so watch I need to sand this round over I have a five inch random orbit sander right the one thing you don't do when you do this watch is go like this to sand it because you end up with facets right and you see that when you put your finish on it okay so you think you're getting good with sanding stuff so you do this right and guess what now because of the control you have on the sander you're not that good you have little facets and you see that when when you put your finish on so what an interface pad does okay is it interfaces check it out I'm gonna put it on again put it on again all right watch see how it see how it fits that contour and I'm gonna tell you what you'd be hard-pressed to see a little flat spot on there this right here is so worth the money the interface pad I every contour I've done since I've been working with Festool or with Festool is the contour pad is one of my favorite accessories to use in the sanding Festool system okay now I I want to eliminate a little bit of confusion okay this interface pad where's the big one? Oh boy right here okay we always had this and this is how it started out see how thick it is but some people were saying it's too much it's too much sometimes so what we did <coughs> is we came out 
with this, which adds up to this basically. So you can stack them, or if you've got a thinner contour, and this comes available, and it's available in the two pack, okay? So it's a thinner version of it. But they're interface pads, they're cushy. And then we came out with this one, okay? See how thin it is? This is, <laughs> technically, it does interface between the paper and the pad, but we call it a protection pad. And the reason we do that is because we came out with a net abrasive. It's granite net for sanding body fillers. And this protects. And, and uh, so, in other words, do you want to buy a pad because you're using a net product, a granite net? Or do you want to just buy replacement protection pads? Okay. And this is a wonderful thing to have if you're using a net product. It goes on there, and it protects the stick fix hook and loops on the Festool sanding pads. So there you have it. Those are your three types of interface pads. Okay, that interface pad is available in different forms. And yes, this is the one for the uh, LS130 and RTS400 with a cord or cordless, and you can stack them. Okay, so there you go. <sighs> okay, <coughs> now. Here comes the fun part, because this is the number one question that I have, and I think at Festool we get all the time. <laughs> hey, listen, I just bought a Festool sander, and uh, I'm, get, I'm, not, I'm getting swirl marks. I've got tons of pictures on my laptop at my desk. People send me pictures all the time on Instagram. I'm getting swirl marks. What do I got to do? So what I always do is I've had this drilled down in my head, and I'm going to ask you a few questions first. Okay, so let's let's set up here. I'm going to get that 5-inch random orbit sander so you can see it. Okay. <coughs> and we built our sanding system around that one thing, how to eliminate swirl marks and how of course, how to eliminate dust and build the finest product for you. Okay. So hey, here's the tip I always tell everybody. Okay? I'm going to turn on the dust extractor. Whoopsie. Okay? <coughs> the first thing I always do, and this is, this, oh yeah, I got the fancy mic on, <laughs> I can still run this, okay, so, the first thing I always tell people is this, and remember I said it's about sanding technique, inspect your pad before you put your paper on, okay, because if you have a, a splinter in here, or some debris, that will transfer through the paper. There's nothing you can do. You'll get swirl marks. So always back your pad. <laughs> I learned that from our automotive trainers over in Germany. Okay? If I have a, <coughs> excuse me, if I have a splinter in there, it, that'll be bad. Now, I've heard this with the Planex. Hey, I'm getting swirl marks from my Planex. There's a lot of times that some of the guys out there are sanding some uh, mud, uh, some drywall mud that's got, uh, it's a still a little wet. What that does is that gets on these little stick fix hooks and hardens. So what happens is no matter what you do, you'll get that swirl mark. So always inspect your pads. Make sure your pads are clean. Okay. When you put on your paper, <laughs> I see people fumbling and bumbling. Line up the holes, please. Okay. I always find one hole. I find a second one, and it lays down. Now. I'll ask the questions. Do you own a Festool sander? Yes, I own a Festool sander. Do you use Festool paper? Now, that is a key component because our grits on our paper are laid out all evenly. Okay, we electromagnetically laid in the paper, which is important, so they wear down, and there's no stray grits that could cause uneven grit that could cause swirl marks. So if you're using a Festool sander, use a Festool sandpaper, are you using a Festool dust extractor? And someone goes, I'm using a dust extractor. I go, is it a Festool dust extractor? Because, Chris, can we get in here? Because with a Festool dust extractor, we put this button on there. And what that button does is that reduces the suction. <laughs> and that's the one thing that a lot of people don't understand with the Festool system. What? That was literally the question that was just asked. What? <laughs> About suction. Oh, <laughs> guess what I'm covering, baby. Whoop, 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 whoop. How apropos. Okay. Okay, I see him. Okay, but we always wait for the end, remember? Okay, so I'm going to turn this on, and I have the suction all the way up. Okay? And now, 
we don't have feel of vision but that's actually tugging too much down okay it's pulling it down and what happens <coughs> is if it pulls too much I start to get a little bit of chatter it starts to skip a little but I have, look, you can actually hear it okay but if I take it now and the an answer to that question how much suction I turn it all the way down when I'm using random orbit sanders I have a better spin I have broken the surface tension so that sander is actually floating okay and I and I'm hoping you follow that okay now I'm sanding that right this is hundred and twenty grit okay what's important is now I'm gonna go to 150 so you'll see this you should always have a rag and wipe that off okay because there may be some uh, grit that broke off of there and is laying on there you can't see it but you should always I, I know guys that will blow it off I guess that's cool okay but now you're breathing all that dust so sometimes I tell people just vac it off or just brush it off okay because that stray grit may be on there and if I put this is 120 if I put 150 on there I have a 120 stuck on there and that's giving me a swirl okay the other thing to remember with that is if you're not going to blow it off all the time grab the super soft pad and this is going to come around a hundred fold full circle we have a sander called the ETS 150 slash 3 the 3 being the orbit we always recommend this one for finishing finishes and guess what pad it comes with the super soft pad <laughs> okay so if you're sanding out finishes I always recommend the super soft pad good so there you go. Sparky, how are we doing? Good? All right, good. Okay, so <coughs> another tip or two when you're doing this, wiping off between grits, but it's also a little bit of technique. I'm going to start here on technique and then go over here on technique with the Rotex. Okay, now I have everything set. Okay, suction is set. I'm using Festool paper. I'm using a Festool sand. I'm using a Festool dust extractor. Okay? I have the correct grit, but you see where I'm holding it? You see how I'm letting the machine do the work? Okay, this is what I can't control. You know that guy in your shop that stands like this because he doesn't want to change the paper? <coughs> in other words, I tell people, relax. If you are not getting that job done fast enough, lower the grit, okay? The 120 will sand this fine because this is surface sanded at 120 from the manufacturer. Most plywood is. So you're not going to go to 80 grit on this. If you do, you stand a chance of burning through the veneer. So you want to use the sander properly. You do not want to concentrate here like this. I, uh, how many times have you done this, everybody? Okay, guess what? There's a dip there. Okay, you see that when you put your finish on. Make sure you let the sander do its job. Okay, I can't say it enough. Everything I've said, that will do it. Uh, now listen, I see what's up on top. Uh, we have the inspection light. I actually, uh, it says, uh, what does that say, Mini? Touch on the, yeah, for finishing. Yep, I can just mention it. I don't know where it is. It's probably kicking around somewhere. You got it? Mm -hmm. Do you see it? No, no, that's the cis light. Oh, the big the one. inspection light. I think I have it in the other room in the drawer. Okay. But uh, l let me just mention that. When I use the inspection light for finishing, um, yeah, I'm inspecting everything. It's, it's a raking light. Okay? The, uh, you can use any uh, Festool light. You can use this duo. It's very big. It's, uh, <laughs> it's loud. <laughs> yeah, it's very bright. You can use a regular cis light, too. The inspection light gives you a longer beam. Okay, and you could actually rake the light here. I usually just set it up. I use it for finishing at home on a tripod because it let when I'm spraying, it lets me lay out and I can see my overlap absolutely perfect. So hopefully that helped. Uh, best pad for resin. Uh, woo. It depends on how level the resin is, but I would probably stay with the medium pad. Okay, if I had to flatten the resin, which you shouldn't have to too much, 
because it self levels itself. And it depends on how it's poured. Um, but I would use the medium pad for the resin. Okay. Um, they'll all work. Now, when it comes to sanding technique, I'm also going to teach a little bit of technique on the Rotex, especially the RO150. Because it's not that we get this question, we have this concern. And I've only heard it a hundred times in training is the concern is how do I take out the vibration in my Rotex? It's too powerful. Well, it's actually quite easy. It's the way you're holding it. Okay, when you hold a Rotex, I never use that handle. This is my handle up top. I hold it here and I hold it underneath with the hose. That way there it's a pad. It doesn't become, if I hold it like this, this thing will take off on me. Okay, there's a little bit of technique to that, but what I want to cover is sanding technique. Okay, as I put this in, I lock it in here. Okay, guess what grit? Now, I look at the surface really quick, and you see, oh my God, there's tons of uh, milling marks on this. I'm not going to sand the whole thing, but what I want to do is I want to concentrate on how to sand this. Okay, um, ooh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the hard pad, Probably got it over here somewhere. Where's Mr. Blue? Where are you, Mr. Blue? There you are. Take that off. When you're using a Rotex. Okay, remember, find a hole. Find two holes. And I'm good to go. Okay. You have a little button here. This is a question we get all the time. Hey, I can't get the pad off. It has to be in Rotex. That way there, listen, there's a pin that drops in. I'm going to get it in there. Okay, there you go. Take that off. It's that easy. I press that button again to hold it. And the pad goes right on. Oh, yeah, right on, said right. Okay. <laughs> okay. And make sure it twists on all the way. Okay? All right. I'm going to hold my pad. Now, see this? Oh, I don't think you... <coughs> I could feel that bump right there. Okay? Do I really want to concentrate on that bump? Do I really want to concentrate on this line right here? No, because I want to end up with a flat surface. Okay, so the proper sand technique that I was taught, I'm going to get this out of the way so I don't break another clamp. Okay, is I always start with the machine on there because I can't put this on directly. I'm going to start it up and I go back and forth. I'm letting the machine cut and I cover the whole surface, okay? And then I go back and forth like this. <coughs> and you're gonna see I'm taking out that high quick, okay? Now, you're gonna notice something. I'm not overextending. I do six to eight inch circles like this, okay? And there's a reason I follow it up with a six to eight inch circle. I wanna cover the whole surface is what I wanna do. And the reason I do 68 inch circles, because if I go back and forth like this, to and fro, like this, on those passes, I could get a cross hatching pattern. I want to follow it up and make sure I get it all cleaned up. Okay? Hopefully you follow that. All right. Now, you're going to notice, watch, I start it on. And then when I turn it off, I remove it from the surface. I'm going to tell you right now. If I had this, watch, and say I'm sanding plywood with this, right, okay, and I stop it, guess what I have under there? A swirl mark. So that's another reason you get swirl marks. But proper sanding technique is back and forth, like this, covering the whole surface. Don't skimp, okay? Then overlap this way. <coughs> okay, and six to eight inch circles. And I'm going to tell you, it's that simple. Now, the other thing is, is when we do the farm table class, <coughs> we have, it actually looks like this when we're, but it's a lot wider. Everybody will say, hey, are we really going to flatten with that? I go, absolutely. We sand the top for about an hour and a half. But we learn proper sanding technique. We learn what grit to start with. Okay. And is that flat when we're finished? Absolutely. 
Okay, now, can you take that and take it to a, a CNC mill and have them flat? Absolutely. But if you, <laughs> the thing is, is when you're sanding a wide board like this, you don't want to overreach because I want to keep this pad flat. If I start to reach like this, this becomes a wheel. So the thing we used to see about control of a Rotex is people would go, see how it's uncontrollable? Not if you make it a pad. Make sure you're standing close to your frame. Okay, that way there, the Rotex doesn't get out of control. And I'm going to tell you what, what do we do? A few passes here, two swipes, and you can see where it's already starting to flat. Look, you could f I wish you could feel that. I'm already knocking out that high down here versus here. Okay, so yes, you can flatten with it. You, uh, will you take out warp or crook of a board? Probably not. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of sanding. Okay, what size sustainer does the Rotex RO150 come in? I believe it is a uh, three. Yep. Uh, oh, T-Lock sustainer three. I don't know exactly in generation three because I haven't gotten any generation three Rotex. It's yet. probably the, the 187, maybe. The 187, Big D says. <coughs> okay, what uh, contour pad do I need for a 125 sander? There's only one, I believe, and that's the 125 interface pad. Uh, let's see, what's the other questions we got? Uh, they have an RO125. Besides small detail sanders, which one gets similar? An RTS or an ETS? Okay, so if you have an RO125, uh, an ETS125, because it takes the same paper, it's the same pad size, 5 inch, um, and it's lighter in weight versus it's a, you get a little more control. Okay. Hey, you know what? That reminds me. That's a, that's a good question we get all the time. <coughs> I don't use, personally, I don't use too many 5-inch uh, random orbit sanders. I've always used 6-inch. Uh, I switched over about, I think, about 18 years ago. And the reason I did it is I don't like the sand. <laughs> 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 okay? And it sounds <coughs> funny, but hear me out. Um, so to answer that person's question, I would automatically put you into a 6-inch uh, uh, a sander. But if you have an RO125, then go into the 125. And okay. Sedge, real quick, it's actually a 237, not the 187. So okay, so it's a 237. Big yep. D said it. Thank you, Big D. That's the man searching. Okay, so what we have here is, and the reason, uh, hear me out, okay, it's not an inch difference, everybody. Everybody says, oh, it's an inch difference. With the no, it's not. It's 32, 33% more surface area. You'll get your job done quicker with a 6-inch sander, and these cat-like reflexes. And these right here are, uh, for me, I actually think sometimes that the ETS 150 slash 5 is lighter in weight than the f ETS 125REQ. Sorry if I'm bumbling on numbers. I apologize. Okay. Do I need an adapter to connect a CT26 to an RO90? Absolutely not. It comes with the 27 millimeter hose. Okay, let's see if I can, uh, I think that's it. Absolutely. Okay, so let's do this. Let's do a quick wrap. I can't believe I just looked at it. I told everybody I think I'd be here 15, 20 minutes, and we're already at 40 minutes. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Let me start calling off people. Hey, South Dakota, Longmont, Colorado, Poole, Dorset, England, <coughs> Hookett Falls, New York, Springfield, Ohio, Glen Geary, uh, Lancaster, PA, Gurney, Bellevue, Nebraska, DeHag, Holland, Cornwall Bridge, Connecticut. Uh, is that two? Cornwall Bridge, Connecticut. Litchfield, Connecticut. Pinehurst, North Carolina. Sacramento, California. That's a two-pack from you guys. La Lake Oswego, Canada. Ottawa, Canada. Nassau, Bahamas. Mechanicsville, Virginia. French Alps. Kailami, South Africa. Kailin, Ukraine. I'm sorry. <coughs> Kyiv, Ukraine. Coloquit, Georgia. Houston, Texas. Chickcaster, UK. Bartsville, Ohio, Holland, Ohio, let's see, East Yorkshire, England, Helena, Alabama, Eden, New York, Malta, 
<laughs> we love you, Malta. Eatonton, Georgia. Louisville, Kentucky. Bear, Delaware. Hey, everybody. Delaware. <laughs> All right. Netherlands. Wah wink. <laughs> I, I, somebody's got to give me pronunciation. Wah widjik. Uh, Netherlands. <coughs> Chade, England. Johannes, South Africa. Minnie, I'm getting you a bigger whiteboard. I can't read your writing. <laughs> Cinnamon, New Jersey. Weekawa, New Jersey. Bloomington, Indiana. Go IU. Wake Forest, North Carolina. Deft, Netherlands, Raymond, Maine, Qatar, Eatonton, Georgia. We got two of those. Uh, Rico, Rancho, New Mexico, Rusa, Illinois, Helena, Montana, Homestead, Sweden, Eaton, New Jersey, Raju, Nagara, okay, Chulton, so Poland, Plainfield, India, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Lake County, BC. Charleston, West Virginia, Montreal, Leeds, UK, France, Irvine, California, Ireland, Mansfield, Tysburg, Mass, <laughs> oh my God. Geelong, Austria, Raw, Bexley, England, Belgium, Tupac, Jed, New Orleans, Greenwich, London, Haverhill, Mass, Solrig, Hungary, Ora, Ontario, Medford, Mass, Leland, Connecticut, Somewhere in Bermuda, <laughs> Kenwick in Bermuda, Kenwick in Bermuda. Hey, Kenwick, how are you? Richmond, Plainfield, and Chomo, Poland. Michael Williams, how you doing, Michael? Charlotte, North Carolina. Stanford, Connecticut. Winston, North Carolina. Okay, and uh, I got another question up there, and I'm going to say this. When would you use an RS2? when I'm sanding a larger area. It's an orbital sander. You're not going to uh, do a, uh, how do you say, uh, you're not going to set a world record with it because it's a finished sander. It's not really a leveler. Uh, it's a finished sander to finish large areas. So that's where I would use an RS2. Hey, everybody, that's a wrap. Wow, how the heck did we go this long? My goodness, hopefully it was informative. There's a lot to know about sanding. Festool is world renowned for our sanding systems and we're really proud of it. And you're gonna notice something in here right now. I don't call it out too much. I, I should. Uh, do you see any dust floating around? Do you see me wearing a mask? Oh, these guys are wearing masks because we're still in a pandemic, <laughs> okay? But <coughs> you don't need, well, you should always use a respirator when sanding. <laughs> You don't see any loft whatsoever, so it's not going to come down and settle. We've captured it at its source. So I want to thank you very much. If you have a Festool sander, hopefully I've informed you a little bit more. Uh, and if you don't have a Festool sander, go out and get one, baby. Don't forget the dust extractor and the paper and the right pad. Wow, that's a wrap. Happy weekend.